Thank you for that kind introduction. So I'm going to go against my instincts and talk. And um, I wish that I had heard the introduction about what this series is all about before um, right now. But we'll, we'll do the best we can. And then when it's time for me to stop talking, um, just give me the sign. I hear a little bit of an echo. Um, but if it doesn't bother anybody else, OK, we're fine. So this is what I plan to discuss. What, what are the causes of a heart attack? What do the guidelines recommend to do for what's called secondary prevention, which is the pre prevention of a second heart attack? Or once you're diagnosed with heart disease, what can you do to prevent bad things from happening? And then uh, some on the latest evidence, if time permits. So here is a schematic of coron a coronary artery. When we are born, I guess I can use this as a pointer. No. So when we're born, we have these beautiful, clean arteries. You're looking down the pipe, and blood's flowing through it. Over time, in other words, as we get older, if we're exposed to certain factors, things change in the lining of the artery. And those people who develop atherosclerosis get plaque formation. They, this is a core of lipid particles, cholesterol, mixed in with some inflammatory cells, and sometimes with calcium, oftentimes with calcium. And um, if the person who develops these, because of their exposure to risk factors, changes those risk factors, there can be shrinkage, thickening of this cap, and a shrinkage of the lipid core. Um, but often, usually, it expands. And this structure called the fibrous cap, which is a barrier between this lipid core and the blood, can get thinner as it's exposed to certain chemicals that are secreted as the body is trying to eat up this cholesterol and get rid of it, it actually can cause weakening of this fibrous cap. And there can be a rupture where it's weakest. And when the fibrous cap ruptures, then blood mixes with this necrotic lipid pool and a blood clot forms. And if that blood clot occupies all of this space and occludes the artery, closes off the artery, that causes a heart attack, also known in medical terms as a myocardial infarction, represented by this bluish area of heart muscle that's dying. If it's not totally occlusive, Maybe it's a small clot. Maybe it's not as big a clot as it would have been because the person is taking aspirin. This can heal without causing a heart attack. And you end up with a narrowing in the artery where that plaque ruptured. And symptoms may develop. Typical symptoms of what's called angina, often pronounced for some reason, angina, for people who don't have the MD after their name. Mm -hmm. And that typical symptom is uh, f feel fine at rest, go up a flight of stairs, and tightness or squeezing or heaviness. No doctor, it's not really pain. I don't get pain, but I get this heaviness. And then it goes away when they stop walking or get to the top and relax or get on a walk up a hill is a typical situation. Or sometimes when people just get emotionally upset, they can get angina. Now, um, medical therapy 
particularly, um, well, let me, I'll take a step back. PCI is uh, sh an abbreviation for percutaneous coronary intervention, basically putting in a stent. When people develop symptoms, the typical thing that happens is they report them to their doctor, typically a primary care physician, who may then order a stress test. Stress test is going to be abnormal, and the person gets referred for a cardiac catheterization. Pictures are taken of the coronary arteries, and if there's a significant narrowing, a stent is often inserted to open up the artery, which results in a relief of the angina. And um, this artery at, at this location, the way it's represented, is that it's not really inflamed where it's healed. It's more like a scar. And in this particular area, as represented here, it's less likely to cause a heart attack in that specific location. But that's the area that calls out um, because of symptoms and gets a lot of attention and gets stented. This area, the fibrous cap, can be treated with medical therapy. High intensity statins result in this liquid core becoming more solid with the fibrous cap becoming thicker and less vulnerable to rupture. So those are the concepts that we, uh, that, that are our understanding of what causes heart attacks and what they look like. Here is a picture of someone who didn't make it. Again, it's a cross section. This is the fibrous cap that has ruptured. This is where the lipid core was. This is where the blood should be flowing, and that's a big blood clot that caused a heart attack. And that is responsible for the majority of heart attacks, the rupture of plaque. And uh, here, I may or may not be able to show you. Looks like I'm not going to be able to show you. I was hoping to, uh, I was going to show you what a heart attack looked like and what it looks like when you put in a stent. So what should you do if you have a heart attack? Uh, in, acutely, you, you go to the hospital as fast as you can and you get a stent inserted to reduce the damage to the heart muscle. But what do you do after a heart attack? So cardiac rehabilitation is a program that's multiple risk factor intervention. Traditionally, it's based on exercise, but it should be much more than just exercise. It should include counseling about nutrition, education about what is cholesterol, blood pressure, how to manage them, how to manage diabetes, and uh, associated with an exercise program and social support. And people who participate in cardiac rehabilitation have about a 30% lower risk of dying compared with people who don't. And it's something that the minority of patients after a heart attack participate in. And so that's one key message. Um, I would ask you, but I'm not going to interrupt my flow by, by doing so. There are, you can separate risk factors into non-modifiable and modifiable. And the ones that you can't change are things like your age and your sex and your history and your family. And the things that you can change our behaviors like smoking. You can treat high blood pressure and high cholesterol or triglycerides. You can treat diabetes. You can eat more healthfully. You can be more physically active. And you can lose weight. The recommendations that uh, are all based on clinical trials, and these are in our guidelines, are to, to eat a Mediterranean-like diet, to take a shortcut. Uh, there's a lot of controversy 
What about saturated fat? What about red meat? What about processed meat? What about salt and sugar and cheese and um, ice cream and other dairy fats and butter? There's a lot of consensus that um, a healthy diet looks like this. Lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, fish. Um, if I left it out, nuts and, uh, and low-fat uh, dairy. Weight control is important in reducing risk. Being physically active, and the recommendation is 30 minutes at least five times a week of moderate intensity exercise. The 30 minutes can be accumulated. It doesn't have to be one 30-minute session. Stop smoking, low-dose aspirin, high-dose statin. A blood pressure goal less than 130 over 80. Dr. Stafford was on the guideline writing committee that came up with that number. And um, certain diabetes medications that reduce the risk of having a heart attack, stroke, or dying. The cholesterol guidelines for people with coronary disease, that really shown on both sides of the slide, basically, um, it's, there's a lot of stuff up here, but the goal is to get the LDL less than 70. Start with high intensity statin, and if that doesn't work, add a drug called ezetimibe, and if that doesn't work, add a drug called a PCSK9 inhibitor, which is a relatively new class of drugs that's injected every two weeks and lowers the cholesterol quite effectively. Um, from one of the trials that I spent about a decade of my life um, working on, called the COURAGE trial, we did a long-term follow-up. These are all people with with coronary artery disease documented on a, a cardiac catheterization. They all had a narrowing at least 70% in at least one artery. And we compared stenting versus good medical therapy and found after about four and a half years that there was no difference in the incidence of death or heart attack between the groups. So stenting didn't prevent heart attacks. There wasn't any difference in survival either, although it was not really, there weren't enough patients to study whether or not survival would be improved during the four and a half years. But we did a long-term follow-up and found that there was still no difference between the group that got stents and the group that didn't. However, there was a difference in those people who achieved the risk factor goals that I just quickly went over. So this just shows this curve this set of curves shows what the death rate was among people who had who achieved no goals, and then one, two, three, four, five, and six. And those goals that were taught, that we studied were diet, smoking, physical activity, blood pressure, um, weight, LDL cholesterol, and for every risk factor goal attained, there was a 16% further reduction in the risk of dying over the period of follow-up. Now, none of us gets out of here alive, ultimately. But we want to be as healthy as we can and be free of symptoms for as long as we can. And doing what are relatively straightforward things walking, if you can walk, um, taking medicine to control blood pressure, taking medicine to control cholesterol, eating a healthy diet, not smoking, those simple things can dramatically reduce the chances of dying if you have heart disease. You know, um, I don't want to take too much time. I have only a hundred more slides that I could show you. <laughs> Um, but I don't know I, if I should um, stop there or talk about some of the newer medications. I'm looking at Dr. Stafford. Yeah, I, I think introducing the newer medications is important. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit more. First, an older medication, and that's beta blockers. 
Um, many of you have heard of beta blockers. One of the most po popular ones uh, that's prescribed is metoprolol, maybe atenolol, maybe carvedilol. Uh, those are generic names. Um, low pressor, toprol, tenormin, uh, coreg. Those are examples of, uh, of beta blockers. If someone's had a heart attack, they should be on a beta blocker for at least a year. The guidelines say up to three years. If someone has a reduced squeeze called ejection fraction, the fraction of blood ejected with each beat, if they have a weakened heart, they should be on a beta blocker indefinitely. And if someone has angina and uh, they prefer to be treated with medication instead of having a stent or bypass surgery, uh, beta blockers reduce angina, and that's another reason for their use. Now, some newer drugs I'm going to talk about are on this slide, but I'll just go straight to, uh, I have a couple slides on each drug. There was a big trial presented a couple years ago called Reduce It, which was a trial in people with heart disease who had high triglycerides or diabetes and had high triglycerides. And the, the intervention was giving a drug that is pure EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, or the actual formulation is called eicosapentethyl. The, the brand name of the drug is Vasepa. You probably have heard or may have seen commercials, V-A-S-C-E-P-A. And so these were people with heart disease and high triglycerides defined as 135 or higher. And they were already on statins, and it was a placebo control. So they either got the active drug, icosapentethyl, or placebo, and there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular death, heart attack, and stroke. And there was uh, a significant difference in many of the other endpoints that were measured. So this is fish oil, pure EPA, but it's not over the counter. I don't know if your over the counter would have the same benefit. And if you have high triglycerides and heart disease, talk to your doctor about getting on Vasepa. That sounded like a commercial. Um, I mentioned PCSK9 inhibitors, drugs that are injected twice a month that lower cholesterol. Here is one of the two large trials. This one was called Odyssey. This drug, when given to people who are already on statins, which can lower LDL cholesterol by 50%, when they take this drug, there's an additional 55% reduction shown in this red line compared with the placebo group. And there was a significant reduction in the primary endpoint, which included cardiovascular death, heart attack, stroke, and something called unstable angina. Now, you can see the separation. It's called statistically significant. None of these are huge reductions, but this is something that can be taken in combination with statins, which also reduce the risk of dying and having a heart attack and stroke. Here was uh, the difference in mortality. So there's a survival benefit with that drug. Now looking at something completely different. It doesn't have to do with lipids. It has to do with blood clotting. Some of you have heard of uh, I believe the brand name for this drug, Rivaroxaban, is Xarelto. I think that's correct. Well, this is a blood thinner, an anticoagulant, which was uh, tested in low dose in people with established atherosclerosis, mostly heart disease. They got either the low dose Rivaroxaban plus low dose aspirin or an uh, intermediate dose of rivaroxaban, the anticoagulant, without aspirin, or low-dose aspirin. And the group that won was low-dose rivaroxaban, the low-dose anticoagulant plus aspirin. 
These are people with stable coronary disease given an anticoagulant, a low dose. And they had fewer deaths, heart attacks, and strokes. For people with diabetes, there are two classes of drugs that in the last few years have been shown to prevent heart attacks, strokes, and, and death in people with heart disease. Um, this, these are results from a placebo-controlled trial called EMPA-REG, and the, the blue lines, so this is time, I should have explained this, and the x-axis is time, and these are events, and the y-axis, percent of participants that had events. And for each of these different outcomes, this is death, heart attack, and stroke. Um, this is cardiovascular death. People who, took, who got the drug lived longer, had fewer heart attacks, fewer strokes. And then there is a class of drugs. Well, I didn't say what this class was called. This has a really difficult name to pronounce. It's, uh, this one is called empagliflozin. It's an SGLT2 inhibitor. But if you have diabetes and heart disease, ask your doctor if you are a candidate for this kind of drug. And then there's another class of drugs for patients with diabetes and heart disease. They're called GLP-1 receptor agonists. And oh yeah, simple name, liraglutide is the name of the drug tested in this trial. But again, small but significant reductions in cardiovascular endpoints with that drug. And this is the last um, drug that I'll mention and then I'll stop. So we, we, we talked a, a little about blood pressure. Blood pressure lowering reduces heart attacks and strokes and prolongs life in people with hypertension and heart disease. Same with LDL cholesterol lowering. Now diabetes drugs that aren't so much about treating the diabetes, they're about reducing the risk of heart attack in people with diabetes. We talked about an anticoagulant, a blood thinner, that reduces the risk. And you can sort of understand that from what I showed you when the blood clot forms, you're preventing blood clots from forming with the anticoagulant. Now this is something completely different. It doesn't affect blood clotting, doesn't affect blood pressure, doesn't affect cholesterol or blood sugar. This is a test of a very familiar drug called colchicine, which is used for the treatment of gout and a less, much less common condition called familial Mediterranean fever. It is an anti-inflammatory drug. And this is a recent study called the Colchicine Cardiovascular Outcome Trial, or COLCOT. And compared with placebo, colchicine reduced the risk of cardiovascular events. I think that this was uh, also uh, cardiovascular death, heart attack, and stroke was the end point. These are not huge differences, but it's a couple percent. And uh, you put it all together, with lifestyle and the right medicines, you can do quite a lot to prevent having a heart attack. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Well, I hope it's OK if I continue to have you up here. And uh, sure. what about the mic? Um, why don't you have the mic? I will <laughs> pay special attention to Jan as loud as I can. But. Um, what I, I thought we would transition now a little bit, you know, I'm a primary care doctor. I see these people who come in to see me and all, I would say 90% of the time, coronary artery disease is just one among many conditions that they have. And so part of my goal is really to help the patient think about what to prioritize. So I was very, it's very encouraging to see the, the data from the COURAGE trial, which suggests that kind of the more things you have under control, the better. But the sort of question I get from patients, and the one I want to ask you, what do you prioritize? What, what health behaviors do you really put at the top of your list? And, and which ones maybe do, do you put lower down the, the risk? All of them are important, 
I think that's you know one indication here, and it it almost seemed like to really get the huge benefit, you had to really be working on everything. But I have patients who ask me, well, what one thing can I do to to really help my risk? Well. Um we don't see a lot of patients who smoke here in this community, but that would be number one. And when we uh, looked at, I'm sorry I don't have the slide, but when we looked at which of those goals had the greatest benefit, physical activity was, I think it was, came after smoking, and then blood pressure came third, having a systolic blood pressure less than 130. And uh, lower down came, uh, came diet. Now, almost everybody in that trial, over 95%, were already on a statin. And so we didn't compare no statin versus statin. Um, if there, was, if there were two medications that I would say are really critical to take, it would be low-dose aspirin and high-dose statin. Great, thank you. So a, another question that my patients come to me with, uh, you know, some of the more learned of my patients have heard of the trial with uh, the ISO-10 with the part of what's in, in fish oil. And their question is, well, you guys keep going back and forth on this. You know, a couple decades ago, fish oil was in, then it was maybe we weren't sure of the proof of that, and then it really fell out of favor, but now it seems to be coming back. But these capsules are really expensive. Can't I just like eat more fish or just use an over-the-counter fish oil in place of this really expensive drug? Really good question. A very learned patient who asks that question. Because what's happened in, our, in the United States is there have been a series of trials using fish oil that showed no benefit. And every time one of those was published, sales of fish oil went up. You know, go figure. I mean, it's really kind of kooky. But there have been a couple of trials, um, one in people that didn't have established heart disease, and then this most recent one in people with established heart disease, using this specific preparation, Icosa... That might be me. Um, Icosapentethyl. And... They both were positive. They both showed a benefit. And so, un unfortunately, yeah, the, it, it's expensive. And um, you're, if you have a drug plan, it may not cover it, or it may, it may cover it a little. Um, but the general rule is, if you want to <coughs> practice evidence-based medicine is you use the evidence from clinical trials and it's anyone's guess if over-the-counter fish oil is as good as would, would you would derive a benefit from uh, for, as compared with the icosapentethyl. So I can't in good conscience say that it's just as good to take over-the-counter fish oil. There was just a trial that was stopped using DHA, docosohexaenoic acid, because there was no benefit. So you have to use the evidence from clinical trials, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I would say that you might be wasting your money if you take over the counter. But if I read kind of between the lines there, you know thinking about myself or let's say my, uh, my father who has coronary artery disease, I might look for a over-the-counter fish oil with lots of EPA in it. Would that be the wrong thing to do? 
it, it's a it's a guess. Mm -hmm. you're, you're flipping a, a coin. I guess I would look at all of uh, look at the big picture. What are his greatest risk factors? How much benefit in the best case scenario if you applied the results from that clinical trial? And you know, I look at that as treating high triglycerides, people with high triglycerides, although we actually don't know if it would work in people with low triglycerides because that wasn't tested. So I would look at his specific risk factors and see which interventions might yield the greatest benefit for him. So you talked a little bit about cardiac rehab. And uh, actually, one of my other like roles that uh, Nora mentioned was on this natural committee, looking at quality measures. How do we measure quality of clinical practice? And cardio, cardiac rehab has come up as something that we ought to be paying more attention to. And some of the data that the group was presented with are really astounding, which basically suggests that if we look at the whole country, Cardiac rehab is essentially unused. Very few people are referred to cardiac rehab, and even among the people who are referred, very few people make it to even six sessions, which is well below what we would recommend. And, and this was quite startling to me, because I think living in this, this uh, <coughs> geographic area, we know of multiple different cardiac rehab uh, locations and we send patients there all the time but clearly something is different in other parts of the country um, what can patients do to try to kind of make sure they're getting the best care and getting referred to cardiac rehab well first of all I would say that I'm not sure that we're much better than the rest of the world the referral rates are not uh, close to 100%, and uh, the showing up rates are, 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 for the first visit, are not close to 100% for those people who are referred. And then completion, it's probably more like 30% completion rate. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if they go to the first visit, um, it, it might be closer to 50%. So. Um, we're not fantastic, but if you don't know that you should go to cardiac rehab, if you are a candidate and your doctor doesn't refer you, you, you lose out. And really what cardiac rehab is, is it's multiple risk factor intervention. It ad addresses all of those risk factors, smoking, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, weight, physical activity, and nutrition. So that's why the reduction in mortality is so big. It, you know, people talk about how effective cardiac rehab is, and it's just the sum of all of those individual interventions. So just one last question. Um, you know, one issue that I run into a lot with my primary care patients is not only do they have the coronary artery disease, they have all these other things. And, uh, you know, quite often those are competing with one another to, for the, the patient's <coughs> attention. There's a kind of limited capacity each of us has to deal with kind of complexity in our lives. Um, and one of the things that I often emphasize is that some of those other conditions, like diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol, uh, things like being overweight, all of those also tie back to some of these health behaviors. And so I view the health behavior <coughs> route as something that not only addresses the cardiovascular disease, but can also deal with some of these other, uh, other conditions that the patient may have simultaneously. And again, in, in my patient population, it's incredibly rare to have somebody who just has the coronary artery disease. And you know, often it goes along with diabetes and high blood pressure, even heart failure in, in many cases. 
So you know, one question for you is how to help those patients kind of see the full benefits of those health behavior changes. Um, clearly it's easier when people are holding your hand as happens in cardiac rehab, but how do patients take on those kind of health behavior changes, especially when they're seeing you know, their cardiologist for 30 minutes or seeing their primary care physician for just 15 minutes? Um, how, do we, how do we help people? That's a really tough question. Thank you very much. Um, well, from a physician standpoint, for, first of all, I totally agree with what you said about health behaviors. And yes, the typical accompaniments of the diagnosis of heart disease is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, overweight, and uh, not so much smoking, as I said earlier, in this community. To start with, it's making a connection for me. It's making a connection with the individual patient. It's uh, just making a human connection. And that's, that's kind of hard to teach in medical school. Um, but that's one of the prerequisites if we're going to get any, make any progress. It's finding out from the patient what's important to them, what is important to you. Um, because, you know, habits are really hard to change and you have to really be motivated. What motivates you to make a change? Is it to see a child graduate, get married, watch a grandchild grow up, attend some important family event? What is it that motivates you? So uh, th that's something to leverage, to, to say, if you want to achieve this, this is what you need to do. And then for me, it's having a team, a dietitian, um, maybe a nurse who's particularly good at following up to see if laboratory tests are done, if medications are being picked up at the pharmacy, you know, are they being refilled? It, it takes a team. Um, maybe engaging the spouse or other family member to help support changes. Um, I, I see you'd be amazed that some couples are, are not perfect. And, um, <laughs> and there can be undermining of uh, trying to reach goals people working at cross purposes. It, it's not easy, but it, it starts with education, building a connection with the patient. It's the, one of the reasons why I think cardiac rehab is so successful is because of the social support. There are other people there physically um, going through the same thing, having the same diagnosis that you can share uh, tricks with, support each other, learn from each other. It's all of that. I don't know the answer. So I'm going to open it up for questions in just a moment. But I did want to go back to your risk factor slide. A couple things there that sometimes I've seen on such slides, but I didn't on yours, perhaps because they're a little bit borderline in terms of the, their causal relationship. But what about stress reduction and sleep? Are those risk factors for having another heart attack? Um, another great question. Um, one, of the, one of the difficulties with those potential risk factors, let's say, is that there have not been randomized controlled trials to prove that, for example, stress reduction reduces the risk of heart attacks. Now, there's good evidence that acute stress 
triggers heart attacks. There's plenty of evidence. Um, you can take uh, d natural disasters and see the heart attack rate spike when there's a huge earthquake. Um, we see uh, people who are going through stressful situations have heart attacks. Um, as far as sleep, um, I actually don't know the evidence so well to indicate that poor sleep causes heart disease. But I'm sure there aren't any clinical trials showing that improving sleep hygiene or sleep, s sleeping more uh, reduces the risk. So there is a difference between risk factors and things that have been proven to cause heart attacks. For example, low HDL, you've heard of high density lipoprotein cholesterol. A lot of people, I would bet some people in this room still believe that low HDL causes heart attacks. But the evidence actually doesn't support that. Um, raising HDL doesn't reduce the risk of heart attacks. Now, in 10 years from now, somebody else will be standing up here telling you that raising HDL does indeed, if it's the right type of HDL, reduce the risk of heart disease. But uh, with our current understanding, it doesn't. So I, I'm sort of a purist uh, on the one hand, and I, I just want to use the evidence. The highest form is a, of evidence is a randomized controlled trial where you take a, a group of people with a certain exposure, let's say it's high blood pressure, and you treat one group and you don't treat the other, or you treat one more intensively than you treat the other, and you see what happens. And it, it's that kind of random assignment where people don't get to choose um, which group they're in that is the highest uh, form of truth in trying to understand causation. So I hope that I primed you to ask really hard questions for Dr. Marin here. I'll start over here. Yeah. Um, I have a question. You mentioned uh, one of the drugs which is a, a beta blocker and uh, also there's another class called ACE inhibitor. My question is what is the difference between the two and what each one does if a person who already has uh, uh, artery disease and has stents? Okay. Um, good. The, the question is, what's the difference between a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor? And boy, I'd love to. Since Dr. Stafford was on the guideline writing committee for hypertension, would you like to answer that or not really? Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> Angiotensin converter, converting enzyme inhibitors, or ACE inhibitors, and beta blockers. They're both classes of drugs that are very typically used to treat high blood pressure. So both reduce blood pressure, but in slightly different ways. And in fact, both seem to have a benefit in the presence of some types of heart disease, particularly the situation where the heart is not pumping strenuously enough, often called heart failure. Now, both of those drugs are probably have multiple benefits. Some is purely from the reduction of blood pressure. In some sense, the less blood pressure the heart has to push against, the, the, the heart's workload is reduced. However, there's probably other benefits of both of those drugs. And there's a lot been said for kind of the hormonal effects that happen as the heart starts to work harder or the, the heart doesn't have enough oxygen supply. <coughs> um, beta blockers are the ones that have the greatest known benefit in the person who simply has uh, coronary artery disease, that is this whole kind of range of things where 
the arteries supplying blood to the heart muscle are either blocked slowly or blocked suddenly. Um, so the beta blockers really come up on top in terms of that situation. Both probably have some benefit beyond their blood pressure <coughs> controlling. And we see that in things like kidney disease, where ACE inhibitors clearly have a benefit of reducing the progression, reducing the rate at which people lose their kidney function. So it's a very complicated area. Both of these blood pressure medicines have benefits. The type of benefit they have may be more than just reducing blood pressure. The, the reason I ask that question, we moved from Texas here eight years ago, and I have a doctor at Stanford, um, because I had a stent done in Houston, Texas Medical Center. Mm -hmm. So I contacted him, so I'm a patient of a cardiologist at Stanford. And so he saw my medicine, which doctor in Houston had prescribed, beta blocker, metoprolol. And the first visit he says, oh, that's very good. Mm -hmm. But I think giving you five milligram of ACE inhibitor is no brainer. He used those words. Okay. And, and uh, I was very curious that he said it's an opener that means so obvious. What was it my doctor in Houston missed? Well, I don't know the whole story, so it's a little hard to speculate. But again, both are, are very good medications. Both of these medications have been around forever. You know, back into the, uh, the 1950s for beta blockers into the late 60s for ACE inhibitors. Um, David talked about a number of these brand new medicines that we're still kind of figuring out how to get the most benefit out of them. But in terms of blood pressure, we pretty much know how to treat blood pressure and do so pretty successfully with drugs that have been around a while and for that reason are, tend to be low cost. And I would add that, uh, not knowing the specifics, but if you had a reduced ejection fraction, it would be a no-brainer to add an ACE inhibitor. If you have diabetes and some protein in your urine, it would be a no-brainer to add an ACE inhibitor. So certain um, of these medicines have very specific, what, what are called indications or reasons to prescribe them. I don't know what it is in your specific case, but there may be something where it, it's, it's obvious that it, you would benefit from the addition of an ACE inhibitor. I do have insulin resistance. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. so that yeah, explains. could be. Yeah. How about uh, in the middle here? Um, a stupid, obvious question. But since you're evidence-based, um, exercise, what, what, what kind of factor is there? I mean, something we can do without actually taking medication. Um, is the question, what are the benefits of exercise? Yeah, I mean, do you have like numbers on that or anything that shows what that exercise can do to help, help keep that? Well, I, I don't have anything on a slide, but I can recite to you some of the benefits of exercise. And there, there's a lot of literature on what exercise does. It lowers blood pressure. It improves insulin sensitivity. So it reduces the risk of developing diabetes. It helps to manage diabetes. It lowers triglycerides. It, in, it reduces the stickiness of platelets. It enlarges coronary arteries. People who exercise a lot actually get larger diameter. That's, it. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. Okay. <laughs> so instead of sitting in, a, in front of the computer for three or four hours a day, I should be out there riding a bike, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's my New Year's yeah. goal. Okay. How about back here? Could you say a few words about the research that's being conducted at Stanford? Um, and as part of that, I've been participating in a Stanford uh, heart study for quite a long time. Every day I enter my activities, it tracks my numbers and so on, but I haven't got any feedback. I've been doing this for about two years, so I'm wondering what's going on. I don't know which study that is, so I'm going to refer you to whoever the principal investigator is. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the trial that I was overseeing. 
that uh, we finished not too long ago called the Ischemia Trial. It uh, was a study of people with stable coronary artery disease, in other words, people with obstructive coronary arteries who were in a stable phase. They weren't having a heart attack when we met them. They all had an abnormal stress test. They had been referred for stress testing of any type for usually because of symptoms of angina. And we randomly assigned them to a group that would go to the cath lab and get pictures of their arteries taken and then go on to have either a stent or bypass surgery, whichever is most appropriate, and optimal medical treatment as described. That was the invasive strategy, or they were randomly assigned to the conservative strategy where they didn't go to the cath lab, but, but they got the same high quality medical therapy and we watched what happened to them over a period of years. And uh, the bottom line is that there was no difference between groups in terms of the, the primary endpoint, which was a, a combination of cardiovascular death, heart attack, um, hospitalization for unstable angina or heart failure or uh, cardiac arrest. And it, this followed the COURAGE trial which showed in people who were sent to the cath lab and had at least an, one narrowed artery that there was no difference between stent or no stent as long as they both got good medical therapy. Um, so that, um, I'm, I'm expecting to hear from the journal tomorrow with comments from reviewers. The pub study hasn't been published yet, but we presented it um, last November and it was covered broadly in the New York Times, Washington Post, etc. So that's a high profile study that um, we did at, at Stanford. The, there was the Apple uh, Watch study that I think we called it the, the not we, uh, they called it the Stanford, the Apple Heart Watch. Anyway. That's the one that I'm in. Oh. It's still running. Okay. Well, you need to talk to Marco Perez. And um, uh, I'll give you his phone, his cell phone number after. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, that was looking for um, evidence of atrial fibrillation using this heart watch or the Apple watch that is monitoring uh, heart rate and uh, had an algorithm that thought it was that, that could detect um, sp speeded up heart rates that increased the likelihood that atrial fibrillation was was present that was a, a very that was a momentous study because it showed that you could enroll tens of thousands of patients really quickly. It took us several years to in randomly assign 5,000 in the ischemia trial. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we're going to have two more questions. How about right here? Uh, you mentioned high-dose uh, statins. Uh, what is, uh, give me a number, yeah. or like Depitor, and also, what about the people who have side effects, muscle aches, what can they do? And is there something besides aspirin that can help the muscle aches? Great question, I expected it. And because in my clinic, I see a lot of patients who want to be treated, but don't give me a statin. And um, when I see those people, I immediately refer them to David. Thank you. <laughs> well, that explains it, yeah. So uh, uh, just a comment about muscle aches and statins. The, when people have been in, studied in the context of a clinical trial, 
and they're getting a drug and they don't know if it's a statin or placebo, there's no difference in the complaints of, about muscle symptoms. However, when they find out <laughs> that they're taking a statin, the rate goes up. There is a, a large um, internet society that propagates um, worries about side effects. Having said that, maybe 5% of people who take statins get muscle aches. And uh, whether or not they're caused by the statins, I, I don't know. But um, let's just dismiss uh, that question mark and let's say you've got statin intolerance. You cannot take a statin. Well, when I see patients such as this who really need to be on a statin to reduce their risk, they have, they have heart disease or they've, they've had a stroke and carotid artery narrowing. We try a lower dose. We try, if that hasn't been tried, we try a different statin. We try taking um, a low dose of Crestor every other day. There are things that we can try. But let's say you can't take a statin at all. Then ezetimibe, Zetia, um, is a drug that lowers LDL not quite so much as a statin. If you can't get your LDL below 70 and you have heart disease um, and you can't get down there uh, with just ezetimibe, then you should go on a PCSK9 inhibitor. And that's the best solution. Another drug is probably coming out this year. It's, uh, I don't know what it's going to be called, but the generic name is bempedoic acid. And it's about as effective as ezetimibe, maybe a 15, 20% reduction in LDL, as opposed to a statin, which will lower your LDL by 50%. And give you some numbers. OK, um, Lipitor is a torvastatin. And a high dose is considered 40 to 80 milligrams. Crestor, which is rosuvastatin, high dose is considered 20 to 40 milligrams. Okay. One more question here in red. I've actually got two, and one's real short. So, uh, first short question is, uh, I understand that something like only 6% of people who have heart attack survive it. Is that in fact true? No. No, it's just the opposite. It's, it's actually... Um, well, well above 90% of people who have a heart attack survive. So you, what you, I think what you were saying is that 94% of people do not survive a heart attack. That was the statistic I read. No, no absolutely not. No. The other question is, um, every single person on my mother's side of the family, and there are plenty of them, part your family, have all died of heart disease, every single one. So I've taken a, a, a statin for 35, 40 years. My, my uh, uh, numbers have always been 100, and, I think it's 120 or, or below. For your total cholesterol or LDL? Uh, the one that they told me was the critical one. So. The LDL. But, um, and it's been at times as low as under 100. And um, I, 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 I'm good on all the risk factors. And all of a sudden, I, I found that I have heart disease. Um, when, you're, when you're doing everything right, and, and it seemed like it came on very quickly, within a period of about three months. And I'm, you know, and I'm, I don't want to brag, but I went out dancing and was challenged by about a 30, 35-year-old woman to a dance contest, and she left immediately thereafter and never came back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm doing something right, you know. What, how, did, how does that, how does it, you know, how does it all come together? A couple of comments. Now, th this was supposed to be for people with heart disease, but I see a lot of people who are at risk or have a sorry, have a strong family history of heart disease. And one of the tests that I get quite a bit is called a coronary artery calcium scan, 
where we can easily diagnose the presence of calcified plaque in people who have no symptoms. And uh, those, it's a wonderful test to uh, help make the decision about treatment of risk factors, how aggressive to be. That said, how could you, who has done everything right, get heart disease? It, first of all, life's not fair. Second of all, you know, your LDL cholesterol, it sounds like, if you were on a high-dose statin, might have been in the 200s, LDL cholesterol in the 200s, without the statin, which suggests that you may have something called familial hypercholesterolemia, FH, which is a genetic disorder. It's one of the most common genetic disorders. And um, that may be why there's so much heart disease on your mother's side of the family. If you have FH, you have a 50% chance of transmitting it to your child. You may have that, I don't know. And, um, and so, and an LDL in the 100 to 115 range is the average LDL of somebody who gets heart disease. It's not particularly low. It's probably much lower than you, it would be if you weren't on the medicine. And then there's another test that doctors generally don't get. But if anyone has, get, develops heart disease and you're scratching your head, why? They, they, everything is good. Uh, lipoprotein little a is, is a factor that causes heart disease and stroke and uh, narrowing of the aortic valve that uh, is not commonly tested, but it's, uh, and it, it helps explain a fair amount of heart disease. So heredity then, is that commonly a, 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 a significant factor? It's a significant factor. People who are dealt a bad hand genetically can improve their, their prognosis by having a healthy lifestyle. Just like people who are dealt a good hand and have a terrible lifestyle can make fit bad things happen. Um, so it sounds to me like you've done a lot of good things and you've staved off heart disease compared with your, your uh, predecessors. Now, I happen to know that uh, my, my bone calcium is low, so I actually take calcium. I remember right, my blood calcium was low. Separate deal. It's a sep separate thing, the, your, your bone density. Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay. I wanted to uh, thank all of you for coming tonight. I think we've had a really great conversation and hopefully we've taken away quite a bit of new knowledge from this. I certainly want to thank my colleague David Marin for joining me up here and providing a lot of expertise on a whole range of things. And this is one of those topics that I'm sure, you know, given six hours, David could easily fill it. So I really appreciate summarizing it down to, uh, to what we can all, uh, you know, handle for one evening. I do want to tell you that this series is going to continue. Uh, the next one will be in April, looking at this issue of heart failure, which we talked about a little bit today. And then we'll have a, a subsequent session thinking about how to use medical technology. And the question about the, uh, the Apple Watch study brings us right to that point and kind of tells us uh, some of these technologies are out there and maybe we ought to be taking advantage of them a little bit more, not only around things like detecting atrial fibrillation, but maybe also helping us with behavior change. So I hope you'll join us in the future. Thank you so much.